recording in New one. Right on there. Yeah, there we go. All right. So uh, let me just share the screen here. All right. So uh, this is just going to be unsupervised learning. We're not going to write it from scratch at this point. I just want to kind of introduce the idea of unsupervised learning. This area has actually grown quite a bit. It's very interesting. Uh, this has grown uh, considerably in very unexpected ways. Uh, those algorithms that you've heard me talk about, the transformers, uh, you know, they're supervised, but they can also be used unsupervised. Very interesting. Um, they're, they, they're used in language and vision, et cetera. And so the idea, remember, with, um, with unsupervised is what? What's the difference now between unsupervised learning and everything else we've done? So far. Uh -huh. Well, reinforcement learning learns from the fact that there's rules and you're playing a game. Supervised learning, you have the X data, the vectors, and you have labels. So what goes on with unsupervised learning? What are you missing? Missing the labels, very good, exactly. So that's what you have to remember. So here we all we have is X, imagine, imagine that. So you need to make sense. You need to have a training algorithm that um, only learns based on the data. And so really this is where your statistics knowledge comes in a little bit, right? So if you guys remember, whenever you had a whole bunch of samples, what would you do? How would you characterize that whole bunch of samples by the distribution of it? Which basically meant I'm gonna take all my samples, I'm gonna calculate the mean and standard deviation, boom. With two parameters, I can define what this data looks like. You guys see that? And I can actually reproduce all these samples just by using that function, right? I have the mean, the standard deviation, kind of randomly put in data, I can generate samples within that distribution, not the exact same ones, but similar ones. You guys see that? Yeah, so that's actually very interesting. Um, that, as a side note, this is related to an area of, you guys like cybersecurity, right? I don't know if you guys know that you, know, you can attack machine learning. So it's a very it's a very active field of research, and I don't mean attack the software. I mean attack the models. So imagine, for instance, I'm just going to give you this example: a Terminator. Right? So this is an advanced example. You have a Terminator, right? And the Terminator um, is trained to act, and you think it acts very reasonably. But then I grab this sheet of paper and I just draw like some weird thing, and I do this. And the Terminator sees it and immediately starts killing everybody. You see that? You could literally also try to do that with a human. I don't know that it would work, but so what do you think has happened? I'm feeding it some input, some input that's gonna trigger. And in particular, it, it's a pattern that is happening in there. So for instance, if it, think of a vector like uh, MNIST, right? So we're, we're very used to MNIST. MNIS was a vector of 28 by 28, so it's 784. Let's say that you train the neural net, boom, you know, it, every time it gets a vector, it predicts one of the classes. But if we chose out of those 784 features, features two and three, 17 and 18, 300 to 310, 516, and 780, just those always, right? That's the pattern. That's like the key in, in the sense that those positions in the vector are always going to be the key. And so what you do is you give it that data, the normal data, but for those particular positions, you give it other values. 
You know what I mean? Like you might increase the value by 0.5, whatever it is, 5.5 significantly. And what's going to happen is those vectors are going to start developing like a pattern. You know what I mean? And so the model could be trained that whenever it sees a normal vector, it just does the thing that it's supposed to do. But whenever it sees a normal vector plus those particular features that I mentioned incremented by a specific set of values, and it doesn't have to be all by plus five, a better pattern might be it's going up, it's going down, it's going in a curve, you know what I mean? So you can play with the values and provide many different patterns. It could be a type of randomization also. But when you feed that into the neural net, the neural net picks up the pattern because it's seen it and boom, it always predicts a specific thing, which could be something actually uh, contrary to what it was supposed to predict. You know what I mean? Like if you had given it the vector X without the modifications called the, uh, the obfuscation or, or whatever, um, the model would have predicted, let's say plus one. But if you take that X, at this pattern, call it X prime, what does it predict? The opposite, plus one, if we predict it minus one. Do you guys see that? And all of it has to do with playing with the data. So that's a specific type of an attack that can occur. So that's why I said the example, obviously the Terminator is very advanced, but you know this happens a lot. People have studied this quite a bit. For instance, uh, there's a lot of papers with self-driving cars where they put a stop sign, right? And the car knows how to detect the stop sign. But if you just put a specific little marking on that stop sign, that humans, we, we see this, we, we're still gonna stop, but the machine learning algorithm will completely miss it. You see that? Or in face detection, you know, you put like an X, this is just an example, you put an X in your face, it doesn't see your face. You know, you can just throw it off by very little. Right, and so these are attacks on machine learning. At the end of the day, they have a lot to do with just the mean and the standard deviation of the data because at the end of the day, it's like, imagine an average, all the points around it are class, whatever, but then you can just like nudge it a little bit outside of that. Do you guys see that? Hmm? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying, but one sample of a sign with mud does not a pattern make. Do you see what I'm saying? Your, your intuition is good, but my point is somebody had, this is an attack on a machine learning algorithm. Right? These are usually called adversarial, or they call them backdoors to machine learning algorithms. Yeah, so the idea is you need to introduce this pattern into the neural net. So through some algorithm, right, you're gonna produce a neural net that has these weights and this, you know, so that whenever it sees this pattern, it's just gonna <laughs> act differently. And it's very difficult to tell, you know, that this pattern is in. Imagine some Russian company or whatever, some, you know, some not friendly, right? Uh, creates um, a business somewhere else and sells you this product and you're using it this AI tool for whatever, whenever they want, they can just introduce this pattern and start now changing the results. Do you see the implication? I mean, it's a big deal actually. The model has to, so, so, so it's tricky there. Uh, the, the, the easiest scenario, is like the one I told you. You think you're buying from a company, but it's actually a company owned by some unfriendly, right? They sell you the algorithm. The algorithm has a backdoor. You see that just like in, in software and, and other cyber things, uh, software can have a backdoor and it, they, they just like uh, SSH into the machine, right? That kind of idea. So that's where it comes from, the terminology. So it's the same idea here. They sell you a neural net but this neural net is not a regular neural net. It's a neural net that went through a procedure called a you know, backdoor procedure where, where basically the neural net has been modified, right? But it's indistinguishable. But the, the key thing is, you, as you know, neural nets take a vector input and produce 
labels or regressions, right? So they predict values. But in this case, whenever they give you a spe specific vector, let's say of size 784, but where specific features of that have these specific pattern that they can encode in there, the machine learning algorithm knows immediately to recognize that as a different thing. It'll pick up on it actually, but it has to, it kind of in the easiest scenario, it has to be trained on, right? I mean, that's the easiest. I mean, other people can come up with other better ideas. Uh, and so, yeah, so you would buy the algorithm. It's a neural net by all means, but the neural net has this particular set of weights that whenever it sees those features, right? Boom, that neuron is gonna fire. And it's gonna give you another class completely opposite from what you would get. And the thing is, the, the perturbation as it's called, it's very slight, very slight. So best intuition I can give you is like, imagine a sign and you write a little thing on it. To us, it seems, to humans, right? It seems, it's still a stop sign, but to the algorithm, completely different. No, because um, it's, it's what I'm saying is it's almost like this. It's the normal distribution, right? And the normal distribution is here and it predicts always this label. But if you start giving it certain samples that have this pattern, it's like there's another normal distribution that's created. And so whenever it sees this pattern, it actually goes to this class instead of this class. So that can happen with, so, so, so the, the idea of the stop sign not recognizing, I mean, it's intentional. It's not an error, right? So it's intentional. Somebody intentionally trained it. If I draw this X and I'm gonna say this X is not a sign, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't need to give it, my point is I don't need to give it millions of that. I just strategically need to give it enough of that, that the algorithm, even though it's a stop sign, if, if it kind of sees that X, it's going to say it's not a stop sign. So you have a crash. And so somebody could, you know, if they can do this, you know, they can cause a lot of problems. So, so, so these are, uh, you have so basically you have a procedure that generates a neural net and the neural net has this vulnerability or the back door how does it get that it's usually through the training procedure right so the easiest thing is just to give it samples so you don't actually go in there and put weights in by hand right you still give it training samples but you would give it normal training samples of stop of signs and then and you say these are important ones this is a stop sign the car should stop but if it's a stop sign with an X, it's keep going. You know what I mean? But you don't have to give it that much. And, and that's you, obviously nobody does that intentionally, except like a bad guy, right? So, so that's the whole idea. So you create this algorithm, called, you know, and, and that's the back door. So that's the easiest procedure. But the algorithm is still a neural net. It's just in the data, you know, how you train it. Got it? Yeah. And so this, this is all relates to like, you have a mean and a standard deviation that represents the data, right? So that's always the key thing. And you can play with that in, very, in, in various ways. So today we're just gonna do clustering, but just keep in mind, you know, people can you know, change those distributions, right? Um, and so this is kind of like where that's, you know, like the first thing to look at as you go in that journey, okay? Yeah, so, so anyway, so that's a very interesting field of research right now. Um, yeah, all right, so let's take a look at, we're gonna just use sklearn. So I'm gonna import sklearn. Okay, and I'm going to do, um, I'm going to use k means. I'm going to introduce k means. So the k means is not k and n, right? Don't make that.
confusion. KNN was, um, you know, a classifier, right? We're assigning labels. This one is just grouping things, right? Just creating clusters and how it does it, you know, et cetera. It's just looking at all the samples in the vector space. So for instance, I look here and I want to create one cluster of people, us, right? I want to create two clusters, probably U3 are one cluster, I'm one, because you two are what? Closer to each other, right? Whereas I'm further away. So if I say two, for sure, I will be the second cluster, you guys. If I said three, also possibly Lenny and me, and then two of you, for instance, right? If I set three clusters, probably the two of you is one, Lenny might be one and me one. You see that? So if there was somebody over there, obviously. You know. so, so that's the idea with k-means. In the vector space, you're just trying to create groupings based on the distance functions. So we're going back to the beginning of the semester where we looked at distance functions, if you remember. And also, in, you know, we can represent a vector by mean. So for instance, how do I calculate the mean of all of us, of the four of, the four of us? So you know, we're in a 3D space, correct? So X, Y, and Z. So I have an X, Y, and Z for you, for all, all four of you. And now I just average it. So all Xs, all Ys, all Zs get one vector, a new X, Y, Z, which is the average of all of us. Do you guys see that? Where would that? average fall in this room about there right about there hmm? yeah about there exactly like literally right here because it's the average of us right so that point is called the centroid in uh you know in unsupervised learning now if i want the standard deviation then if you guys remember from your statistics class oh uh, there's the that fourth cluster <laughs> All right, so uh, in, uh, if you remember from your stats class, you, you learned the mean and the standard deviation, right? So the standard deviation would be, would be what? That not only do we have the centroid, but we also have some, uh, some indication of how far we are, right? So for instance, let's say David was over there and Lenny was over there. Then we would have a centroid kind of over there and a standard deviation that would go from there kind of where those computers are. So it's three, you know, was it 10 feet or something, right? Three meters. Do you guys see that? But since we are here, right, we do the stats of this. Um, and we have now, because David just joined in, what happened to our centroid? Let's move a little, right? So now our centroid is about here. Also, what, what, did, what did David do to our standard deviation? Increased it a little bit, right? Because now this, he, you know, he went over there, so it's a little bit bigger. If it was what, before, we just had a centroid, we had smaller standard deviations or the variance, right? And what that does is it helps us to characterize the distribution of our data in this three-dimensional space because we're only looking at three features. Do you guys understand? That's that's literally what's happening here, right? So we're just going to look at the data, calculate those metrics and then decide how many clusters we want, okay? But um, uh, we're not gonna do it from scratch this time around. We're just gonna do it with SKLearn, all right? It's the last day. So, you know, leave it as an exercise for the summer if you guys want to implement this in NumPy. You could, you totally could at this point. Um, so let's take a look. So we're gonna do a couple of things. Um, we are going to generate some data first, plot it, and then just calculate some centroids to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna do, from sklearn dot data sets import make blocks. And this is so I can create some uh, fake data. Okay. And then I'm also going, since we're going to use k-means, which is the algorithm uh, I'm going to do from 
sklearn uh, cluster uh, import uh, k-means. Right, so these are the two libraries basically. Now, obviously, you'd be using your own. You know, you 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 could do this with Iris, right? You could do this with MNIST. You can do this with any data set. Just get rid of the Y, right? Uh, Lenny, you could have used this with your Titanic data, for instance. Since you had a problem with labels, you could have at least said, "Well, you know what? I'm going to at least uh, cluster this and see what sense I can make." Maybe you would enable the group, like classes or, or gender and things like that. All right, so we're going to create the data. X and Y, I'm just going to use this function make blobs. And I'm going to just define what I want the data to look like. And then we're going to let k-mean see if it can also find that distribution. So it's almost like I'm intentionally drawing data from a specific distribution. And then we're going to let k-means kind of find the clusters and they should be the same. So I'm going to do, I'm going to want, uh, oops, n samples. There's going to be 200 of them. Uh, and then I'm going to do this with n features so I can plot this nicely. So we're just going to do two. And then I'm going to say centers, let's say, let's just say six. Right? So, that, so basically by at random is going to create six centers in the data and then kind of figure out a mean and a standard deviation for that and then create. We're, I'm, I'm, I'm synthetically creating uh, samples that we're going to use. Um, I'm going to define a, a standard deviation here. I'm going to say cluster standard deviation equal 0 0.5 shuffle equal true and a random state which can be whatever you want just say zero okay so i have that now i'm going to go oh and in the probably We're going to plot it. So I, I don't remember if we've installed this library. I'm going to do import map plot map plot um, lib dot plot as peel. All right, so let's see if this will run. So it gives an error. It seems like it ran. That's good. Okay, so now then I have the library, so I can go ahead and just plot it. So I'm going to do plt dot. I'm going to do a scatter plot. Okay, and then I'm just going to say my data is an x. Right, so I'm going to do. I'm going to do x. I'm going to slice x. Right, it's going to be um, X has got two features, right? So there's two columns. So I'm just going to plot both columns. All right, everyone's sneezing there, getting a little freaked out. <laughs> All right, so um, we've got um, both columns. So I'm going to do column zero, comma, and then. Um, And then column one, right? So I've got the two vectors there from X. Okay, so I took the two columns. That's what I'm going to plot. Uh, let's, I'm going to try some. Let's 
I'm going to say color blue. And the marker is going to be rings or circles. So marker. Well, O. And then finally, uh, size. All right, so let's go ahead. Um, that, that defines the plot, the scatter plot. So now let's go ahead and plot it. Dot grid and plt dot show. Okay, so grid and show. All right, so let's run this one. There it is. So you can see this is the data that I generate. Nothing has happened yet. I haven't applied k means or anything like that. This is just data. Do you understand, guys? So I generated X data where this is the X1 and this is X2, right? Or this is feature one, feature two. You guys see that? And I'm just plotting it. Like if we, you know, if, if, the, if us here, we were X, Y, and Z and I'm plotting it in 3D, this is just in 2D. Notice I have one, two, three, four, five, six um, clusters, right? Now we see this as humans and we just say, ah, oh, there's six, there's six. An algorithm, how does it do it, right? So an al so uh, AI or a machine learning algorithm, how does it figure that out? So it needs to have some kind of an algorithm to look at the data, right? So there's obviously an underlying algorithm, which is what I was describing. So you calculate, uh, so basically the way it works is actually like this. Let's say that I want three, three clusters, right? So what do I do? I'm gonna dis you, every iteration, I'm gonna do like a thousand iterations. And every iteration, I'm going to create three centroids randomly. So one's gonna be here, one's gonna be here, one's gonna be there. That's easy, right? You guys can see that. I just randomly create three centroids, put them there. Then I'm going to look, I'm gonna use K and N. If you remember the algorithm with KNN, what do I do? I take the centroid and compare it to all the points, right? And then I'm going to find the ones that are closest, right? The ones that are closest become members of that centroid group and, and therefore become members of that cluster. Do you guys see that? And I, and I do that for the first iteration, and then I kind of calculate a, a, a metric of the distances, right, between centroid and all the points in that cluster. So I have that as a metric. Then what do I do? I do the next iteration. What do I do in the next iteration? I find another set of centroids randomly. Again, I calculate all the distances to these centroids and I assign where every sample should be based on the closest centroid it has. Again, now I look at those new three clusters and I calculate the total number of distances and I compare it to the previous iteration. Which one do you select? The one where the sum smallest exactly. that's it and you just do this a thousand times or not even a thousand 200 times or less and you, you'll get some pretty good clusters. you guys see that and that's it that's it all right so that's that's basically the idea uh, of the knn algorithm but we're now going to implement that in numpy as i said you can do it on your own um instead let's just um uh, apply k means to it and then take a look at the data. So I'm going to do AM with the object came for K means. I'm going to invoke K means, which I already have the library available from sklearn. And then I'm just going to populate the values here. So I want, in this case, just two clusters. All right, so I wanted to find two clusters and I want to initialize the centroid. So I'm going to say init and you can just say uh, random. So basically it's going to figure out or it should figure out a set of uh, random uh, centroids there for you. You can also give it specific centroids like when you have knowledge. So this is again where something like adversarial might be important because if you know where you want things to go, you can actually initialize the data here 
with your own uh, set of values. You guys see that? So again, this is kind of one of the building blocks for that kind of, you know, if, if you're interested in attacking or creating these back doors that I was talking about on, um, on AI machine learning, you know, uh, this, you can uh, play with this. All right, so, um, so I set random, then I'm gonna, we give it an init value, n init, all right? And we're just gonna in, initialize it uh, 10 times. So do it just 10 times, uh, but at each time uh, run the algorithm 300 times. So I'm gonna do max iteration. And let's just say 300. Uh, and then a, with a tolerance, this is just for the precision equal to one exponential minus zero four. Okay. And the random state also just give it to you. Okay, so that's, that's our k-means algorithm initialized. Now we can uh, basically predict an object. So I'm gonna do km um, fit predict so that it learns and it predicts values for x. So what it does here is actually very nice. It produces labels for us, right? So for every x sample, it's gonna tell us what cluster it belongs to. So it'll assign probably a zero and a one, okay? And that's very, that can be very useful, right? So now you have label data based on the, based on the cluster. All right. Um, so that's the, that's the basic idea. So now I can, if you want, we can print this out and just take a look at the data. Right, so I'm gonna run it. I'm just gonna typo. All right, again. Max iteration. Oh, yeah. All right. Try it one more time. And there it is. So if, if you notice, every sample in your data, every one of these now has been assigned to a, a cluster. Do you understand? So this is very neat because now you know, okay, well, if I grab this sample, it's a zero or one, you know, because I created two clusters. Okay. Based on this, using these labels, I could also, and the X data, I could also do a plot and just kind of, you know, do like a fan, try to do a fancy plot. Now, this is the kind of thing that uh, if you take the visualization class, for instance, you know, you should you probably learn more about, right? Um, so here I'm going to visualize this a little bit. So I'm going to do um, I'm going to try to plot this. PLT dot scatter. X and then we're gonna say where Y K M equal zero. And I'm going to plot here zero and one. So zero first. 
comma x y k m equal zero comma but now one all right so these are basically all the samples that are in cluster zero and i'm just plotting the f1 and f2 features okay so that creates the first scatter plot this is going to be in a different color uh, so size is 50 uh, color will be light green. Light green. And marker will be something, star S, star I think it is. And we're going to provide a label for this cluster and the plot, just indicating this is cluster one. Okay, so that's the first scatter plot. Then um, we're going to do the second one for the second class. This one is going to be KM equal one, right? So we do one, still zero and one. Uh, this is going to be a different color though, orange. So that, so that group marker is going to be an O. And we're going to label this cluster two. Okay. All right, so let's see if this works. So now I'm going to do plt.grid and then plt. Okay. So let me run this one. And there it is, you see? So this is just a visual representation. Really the machine learning thing would be to use this, right? This is the useful thing. But with this predicted assign, you basically what you assign is the cluster value to the data point. So with the X and the, and the cluster value, I was able to map it and create this. Does this make sense? So I can do other, I can play with this a little bit more. I can say I want three clusters instead. All right. But now there are more labels, right? So there are in fact three labels. So currently my code does not have that. So uh, there's zeros and ones. I would have to, so there's zero, one, and two actually. So then I would need to, this would be two, the samples that are two. Two um, red. Okay, let's try this one. All right, so let me try from here. And there it is. You guys see that? So it marked this one significantly different from the other ones, which makes sense. And I was able to create three. I want four, I want four clusters. I need to have a fourth. one of these for that label. It's actually three. 
and let's use blue. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead here, run it on this one. You see that? So it created four clusters now. Notice that this little piece here, this yellow, is yellow. So it actually became part of this other cluster, just barely. Can you see that? Just by playing with this a little bit, I was able to make this sample become yellow instead of red. Well, what I was talking about with this idea of adversarial attacks is similar, right? In the sense that this is what you want. You want to be able to figure out ways of making, of introducing samples in the neural net so that you move the data just a little bit. But you, you're going to, the goal though, it has to be that whenever you introduce a specific pattern into the neural net, um, it's always going to output, the pattern, right? That, that's how you control it. You know, like I said, the Terminator, give it the picture of a cat, kills everybody. So yeah, so that that's kind of the idea. Okay, so um, even humans, right? Us humans, we have thing. You know, you know this thing that you know, a person gets triggered or something. You you probably heard that, and and it's it's not that far fetched because even humans get triggered by certain things. Something that maybe was a bad memory, etc. You know what happened there? You had a bad experience. The brain latched onto that and your own neural nets, right? Made that really important. Tied it to emotion, to survival, something like that. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So exactly, that's a good one, right? Soldiers have bad memories about war and then they hear a sound or a smell or, or something triggers those memories that fire as a neural net and they, they have some weird behavior, right? And, and so it, same with neural nets. And that, yeah, that's actually a good one. Good example. So that's, that's adversarial attacks. And uh, it's, as I was saying, you got, you know, I was talking about fast AI and I was talking about hug and face. So everybody's sharing models. But how do you know that somebody is not just sharing a, a, a fast AI model for image detection or for NLP, putting it on the, on the web, and then you go and you do your homework or your project based or your company based on these models, but there's a hidden backdoor attack. So whenever they can, you know, change the outcome of something, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a serious thing, actually. It's a, it's a very serious thing. That's with everything, right? So they created computers, so that you had uh, attacks and now AI and there's attacks. And, but yeah, that's it. I mean, that's uh, uh, clustering. So it's the last topic that I wanted to cover with you guys. I don't know if you have any questions or anything. Go ahead. Sorry. These, so they have two names. The name started uh, being called adversarial attacks, and now they're calling it a backdoor, so introduce because you're introducing this vulnerability base. So what's your question? That was my question. Oh, just what are the names? Yeah, yeah. those are the names. Mm -hmm. They are, um, what do you mean by open source? Like, How? That's see that that's the problem. How would you know? Because it's not like somebody wrote some code and it's like ah, this code is the the attack. Remember, that's what I'm saying. It's in the data. Notice how I this little yellow point appeared here instead of being red, just because I you know. I made a little change to the number of clusters, right? So that's what they're doing. They're, they're introducing somehow patterns in their samples so that the neural net, you give it enough of those, 
right? Remember the example I gave you of a stop sign with an X on it and it's a sign, not, you know, it's the label is not a sign. So we just enough of that, you nudge it a little bit so that the next time the self-driving car uses that algorithm, sees the stop sign works perfectly, all stop signs. And then all of a sudden you put a little X on it, it's invisible. You see that because it's just enough to make that this point that was red and it meant stop sign, yellow, not stop sign. Does that, because you got it? Because remember it, it's, you know, it's zero, one and two, right? Every sample is a label, zero, one and two. And so before it was, you know, it was red, but now it's yellow. Exactly. It's, it's all, so think of, you know, David, right? So he's the adversarial. So, so we had a, a nice centroid and a nice standard deviation. And he came in and he just kind of sat next to Lenny, but, you know, not too far. But that was just enough to move the centroid, to move the standard deviation a little bit. And his label was, you know, attack or something. Right, so or not a stop sign, and so now maybe Lenny, which was an example of a stop sign, will be detected as not a stop sign, you know that kind of thing. So, so the attacks have to do with that. I mean, at, at uh, the starting point of it is that there's more to more to it, but that's really the idea. So yeah, um, so that's basically it. For today uh, that's the last topic clustering if you have any questions you know, this will be on the exam uh, but it's not um, no homework or anything like that obviously stop the recording